The placenta and umbilical cord are part of a complex system that allows the maternal circulation to both oxygenate and eliminate waste from the fetus without mixing maternal and fetal blood. Transport of substances to and from the fetus occurs via a permeable membrane on the maternal surface of the placenta. Once cleansed and oxygenated, the blood travels from the placenta via the umbilical vein into the fetus flowing toward the liver. About half the volume continues via the umbilical vein into the liver. The remaining volume enters a vessel called the ductus venosus, which exists only during fetal development and closes to become a hepatic ligament following birth. The ductus venosus travels a short distance and joins the inferior vena cava, where the blood mixes with deoxygenated blood returning from the lower regions of the body and continues through the vena cava into the right atrium of the heart. Here, the circulation again deviates by shunting the blood directly to the left atrium through an opening in the septum called the foramen ovale. Backflow to the right atrium is prevented by a valve called the septum primum. In the fetus, the heart functions as a two-chambered system, only becoming a four-chambered pump when placental circulation ceases. During gestation, the fetal lungs are non-functional and need only enough blood for normal development. The majority of the circulating blood pumped from the heart into the pulmonary artery shunts into the ductus arteriosus, bypassing the lungs entirely. In the fetus, the majority of circulating blood is mixed. In other words, venous and arterial blood combine and flow to the organs and other tissues to provide oxygen. Fetal hemoglobin has a much higher ability to carry oxygen than adult hemoglobin and provides the developing fetus with adequate oxygen for normal growth and development, despite the mixing of arterial and venous blood. Following birth, when the heart begins to function as a four-chamber pump, back pressure against the septum primum is constant, holding it closed. Over time, the valve will grow into the septum and permanently close the foramen ovale. Pulmonary flow to the lungs increases and the infant begins oxygenating his own blood. The aspect of fetal circulation that most directly affects the nursing assessment is the ductus arteriosus. In the hours following birth, the ductus slowly closes and the circulatory pattern becomes the same as in the adult. This closure results in a transient murmur that usually becomes audible at about two hours of life and then fades and ultimately ceases over the next 24 to 48 hours. A ductus murmur that persists indicates a condition called patent ductus arteriosus, a failure of the ductus to close. Though uncommon, this necessitates medical and sometimes surgical intervention. The cardiac and respiratory systems are closely aligned and it is best to assess them together. Cardiopulmonary assessment begins by closely observing the infant beginning with skin color. Is it pink, pale, dusky, or blue? Is there acrocyanosis present? In other words, does the baby have blue extremities but pink face and trunk? Acrocyanosis should be resolving but may still be visible in the hands and feet for the first few hours. Evaluate the respiratory effort. Is it easy or labored? A cardinal sign of respiratory difficulty is visible retractions in which the chest surface is pulled inward during inspiration. Retractions may be observed above the clavicle, called supraclavicular retractions, between the ribs, called intercostal retractions, or below the ribs as subcostal retractions. The infant may also make a grunting sound at the end of exhalation. Grunting is a sign that the infant is instinctively creating end expiratory pressure to keep the alveoli expanded and is another sign of respiratory distress. 